Hi, Jake Williams for Rendition InfoSec here. Wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, a couple of things that are happening in the European Union um, that may affect us all. All right, so whether you live, work, uh, do business, etc., in the European Union, you should absolutely be aware of this. Uh, if you are not familiar with GDPR, uh, you probably should be. Um, and uh, if you are familiar with GDPR, then I think you probably are tracking with why this is going to be a, why this is going to be a big deal. Um, I want to talk quickly about Article 11 and Article 13. Uh, they're going to vote uh, tomorrow. Uh, the European uh, Parliament, actually, is going to vote tomorrow on uh, these two articles. Uh, article 11 is uh, largely known as the link tax, and Article 13 uh, is largely, uh, basically, would be an expansion of what DMCA is, a very, very large and heavy-handed expansion of what DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, is in the U.S. Uh, most of us know that the, uh, or we think, believe that DMCA is probably overreached. My favorite story ever about DMCA is a gentleman that was uh, published uh, some <clears throat> some files. Uh, he had patched out uh, some things in X server. And if you're not familiar with X server, uh, this is largely what uh, Linux uh, and Unix GUIs uh, run on, right? So this gentleman had patched out some files on a uh, on an X server, um, and he actually uh, uploaded them something as like xorg source files .tgz or something along those lines, uh, uploaded them, and that TGZ uh, ended up on a file sharing site uh, for which his ISP then uh, gave him a takedown notice, uh, basically, or, or received the takedown notice uh, from 21st Century Fox or 20th Century Fox, whatever, uh, basically because they felt like he was pirating and sharing X-Files videos. Now, clearly, Xorg files have nothing to do with X files, right? But the fact of the matter is that a copyright holder or a authorized agent of the copyright holder made a complaint. Um, the onus is not on his ISP to go track down is this complaint valid or not. Of course, he has the ability to go fight that complaint. Uh, but the reality is that, uh, you know, again, the, the DMCA itself is even largely heavy handed. Uh, Article 13 is, uh, man, it, it is it is far, far worse. So let me talk about these very quickly because um, Depending on how the vote goes tomorrow, of course, I know in the U.S. we're all enjoying fireworks and hot dogs and whatnot today. Uh, but, of course, uh, I'm over here in London at the moment. Uh, and so this is looming heavily on uh, Brexit or no Brexit. This is looming very heavily uh, on the minds of uh, many of these Euro uh, many of the Europeans that are in these classes uh, or in classes over here. Very quickly, want to talk about this this link tax uh, as well as the uh, the copyright uh, issue. So I'll start with Article 11, um, and I'll put a link to a uh, to a blog post uh, so you can read up more about this uh, yourself. Um, again, not a blog post necessarily that I wrote. Uh, I'll link you to some other people who have done some great work on this. Uh, but as far as this, this link tax goes, uh, and again, that's what it's being called. Technically, it doesn't establish a link tax in any way. Uh, what it actually does is uh, basically uh, limits the ability of a third-party site to show a preview um, of what they're linking to. Right. So uh, typically, uh, you know, and if you've ever searched Google News before, uh, I certainly do uh, news searches occasionally. Uh, I'll be honest. There's times when the preview is enough for me. Uh, the first couple uh, sentences uh, of the uh, basically the preview, the photo, the first couple sentences, the headline tells me what I need to know about that particular news story. Right now, again, if that sounds short sighted, uh, great. But, you know, it, it, particularly with breaking news, uh, for instance, uh, active shooter event. Uh, if I want to know if there are confirmed fatalities, I know that's going to be led with. Right. And so, again, here, I don't really need to go click the link necessarily. And that's kind of what, uh, you know, what this uh, link tax is, is supposed to address or Article 11 specifically. I'll stop calling it the link tax. Uh, but what that's supposed to address. The European Union is making the argument effectively that uh, publishers are losing out on revenue uh, because people are using uh, large uh, wholesale snippets of their content uh, in their content, right? And they're doing so without licensing, right? So, uh, of course, uh, Google Preview uh, would be an example of this. When I post a link on Twitter, uh, you always see a preview there of the story. Uh, again, if the link tax goes through, uh, excuse me, article, article 11 is approved tomorrow uh, wholesale uh, by the uh, European Parliament. Of course, we'll still have to see how member states interpret, uh, you know, interpret it. But I think it's very realistic to assume that, uh, you know, again, that uh, this licensing is, is, is then going to be a problem. Now, of course, this creates uh, creates issues for let's consider a platform like Twitter. Right? Uh, if I then, as a content provider, uh, post something on Twitter, there's no actual safe harbor exemption. Right? So uh, Twitter, effectively, then, or any content aggregator, uh, you know, and again, there's always this question of who owns the content specifically. Right? Uh, 
bottom line, there's no safe harbor exemption. Uh, if the, let's say again, I'm, I'm going to use the Twitter example here. If I post snippets of content or quotes of content directly, um, and, and again, there's a lot of question about what is a quote and what's not, that there is an exemption for that for the context of academic research. Um, but it does seem to be uh, geared, again, towards academic research. So quoting an article there, uh, not necessarily quoting it, uh, you know, again, it, it's unlikely that that exemption is going to allow us to say, again, post a link with, with content on Twitter. Uh, so the content preview on Twitter. Of course, this is uh, mildly concerning, I think, uh, because, you know, if we kind of step back here and, and look at this, this is going to force a lot of our media platforms, uh, particular social media platforms, uh, to, uh, you know, either pay licensing for these uh, particular articles um, or in a uh, another uh, possibly more dystopian case um, is simply going to prevent the linking of those articles entirely. Right? And so uh, that that's kind of what I picture. That said, uh, you know, from a security perspective, I, I'm mildly concerned about the lack of a preview. Right? I, I feel like without uh, without a preview, I think we're more likely to see uh, malicious attacks with links. Uh, you know, certainly. Uh, again, if there's a, uh, you know, again, we're gonna have to look at how uh, <clears throat> how some of these uh, publishers uh, create their licensing models because again. Even if I have a license, uh, let's say that I negotiate a license with the uh uh, let's say uh, a Wired magazine, for instance, right? And I'm just pulling them out of a, uh, you know, out of out of kind of my back pocket there. Uh, let's say I coordinate with Wired magazine, uh, and I get a license uh, specifically. Let's say it's even for a story I'm quoted in, right? And I say, oh yeah, I totally want to publicize this for you. And by the way, a lot of the reporters that I work with, um, you know, I, I tell them for sure that I will go ahead and tweet out the articles that they're writing, um, and again, do that as uh, you know, obviously to help promote uh, their content, uh, but also because it's it's just good, uh, just good business. Um, now let's. Let's say again that they've agreed that because uh, either because I'm quoted there or because whatever they like my tweets that I can go ahead um, and uh, you know basically use uh, previews or snippets um, of their content uh, under the Article 11 that may not be allowed specifically because it's not clear who owns my content on Twitter right um, again when we look at and, and again when I say it's not clear who owns it I mean from the context of Article 11. Um, it does seem likely that Twitter itself would have to then negotiate for licensing. That creates a whole new problem in and of itself, right? If Twitter then has to determine whether or not, and again, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, insert social media site here, or any media site for that matter, if they have to negotiate for licenses individually, one of the things that I foresee that is certainly going to be an issue um, is the selectivity of licensing that they negotiate. Right? So picture for a moment here that, uh, that that is actually the way this is going to roll out. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera, are going to have to negotiate licenses. Um, suppose for a moment, and, and again, I'm not going to go super political here, but suppose for a moment that they negotiate licenses with Breitbart, uh, but deci decide not to uh, negotiate a license with the Washington Post. One might assume that Breitbart's licensing model would be uh, substantially more favorable, uh, substantially cheaper, uh, per se, than, uh, than let's say the Washington Post, which tends to be more quality journalism, or, or again, you know, without getting political here, again, has a much larger a body of journalists maybe is a better way to put that without uh, without potentially annoying anybody um, but but let's let's point out here that again fringe news sites and, and fringe news uh, uh, basically aggregators are, are likely to want to spread their message more uh, now that's not necessarily high quality journalism, right? Now, nothing will prevent you from actually putting a link up. I wanna be very clear about that, that there's not a tax to actually link to a site, right? There, there's nothing there, um, it's only with snippets. But, but again, let's be very clear here too. If I post a link to the Washington Post and somebody else right beside me posts a similar story, but with, with a, an actual, uh, you know, an actual preview, it's got an image, it's got a couple of sentences there, it's not even clear that you can link the title of a story since that itself is actually a snippet and often contains, uh, well, the headline often contains the most critical part of the story. Again, in journalism, they tell us don't bury the lead, right? Uh, so again, I, I foresee a, a potential problem here where some of our media sites, again, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, et cetera, uh, Facebook, uh, go out and negotiate with uh, possibly not the best journalistic sources. Um, and, and of course, that could be a potential issue uh, coming down the road, right? So, uh, of course, uh, you know, I, I need not uh, necessarily roll back to the 2016, uh, 2016 elections, but, but I will point out that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of congressional testimony recently about how the influence, uh, foreign media influence, uh, played in at Facebook, right? And of course, there's this whole concept now of, you know, what is fake news versus what is not. Uh, recently, uh, Zuckerberg uh, testified in, uh, in front of Congress 
in front of the Senate. Um, and they just released, Facebook just released back a 700 and some odd page uh, response um, to uh, all the questions that they had uh, basically had outstanding uh, at those hearings. Right? And so not non-trivial uh, and, and a huge portion of it focuses on what are you doing to combat fake news? Well, I want to put this in the context of Article 11 because in the context of Article 11, if a site comes out right, and says, no, no, it's full Creative Commons, you have full permission to use anything we want or sorry, anything you want without any licensing fees, go for it, go hog wild. I expect to see those sites quoted the most, and as well as, again, driving link traffic uh, to those sites, right? Again, social media uh, people, uh, or people that are prolific on social media that generate the most clicks, um, again, are, are very well skilled in, uh, or sorry, very skilled in in what it is that uh, what it is they do and how they generate those clicks, right? Uh, you know, I'll be the first to tell you that I've done a lot of A-B testing on Twitter as well as LinkedIn and Facebook, uh, and I know what, uh, what type of content gets the most engagement on those different platforms. In fact, if you, I don't do a whole lot on Facebook, but if you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll see that I very often post different styles of content on LinkedIn uh, than I do on uh, on Twitter. And again, that's just, it's just good marketing, right? Uh, again, it, it's uh, it's playing to a, uh, you know, playing to a particular audience, uh, you know, and again, the, playing to the limitations of the platform. That said, if we step back then and take a look at, uh, again, we know that things with link previews, with photos, uh, pictures, et cetera, those tend to drive engagement, right? That, that's just good human psychology. Um, again, if we happen to have uh, some sites who are Creative Commons and they're simply sharing, uh, basically saying, hey, no, anybody wants to post a link to us, go for it. Uh, by the way, I'll be the first to say that, uh, you know, Rendition InfoSec and our blog, uh, as well as any other media that we create into the future, um, is going to be Creative Commons forever, right? If Article 11 uh, passes, we'll be the first, uh, of course. And again, you know, we're very small potatoes, um, but uh, very small potatoes in the, in the media world, right? But anything we create, again, will remain Creative Commons because, again, that, that's just the right way to uh, the right way to go. In fact, uh, hopefully this week, and if not this week, early next week, um, we'll actually have that published on the website uh, so that there's no question about how you can and cannot use our content. Uh, again, I'll hasten that if that vote passes tomorrow for Article 11. Um, that said. Right, so uh, that kind of circles around, uh, you know, some of my fears, some of my concerns. There, uh, another possibility is, by the way, too, that that again, uh, for those citizens in the European Union, uh, again, where that content is not licensed, uh, we may see a lot of geo blocking. Right, I've been over in Europe now several times since GDPR. Uh, this is actually my my fourth different country that I or say fourth, I guess we'll say fourth trip into Europe since GDPR. Uh, passed. That's actually so GDPR became official. And as I'm looking at the date here, July 4th, that actually makes me question some of my life choices here uh, with the amount of travel that I'm doing. But in any case, um, I can tell you that consistently uh, my user experience here in the European Union, going back to sites uh, typically, which are, are honestly typically coming out of North America, my user experience is already different, right? Um, I can only imagine what my social media experience uh, would turn into, uh, again, if, if Article 11 passes as written. Okay, so that said, let's talk about Article 13. Article 13 uh, is a expansion of what DMCA uh, typically is, right? So under the law in Article 13 or under the rules uh, set forth in Article 13 uh, by the European Union uh, Commission, uh, basically what we're seeing here is that as opposed to DMCA where if a user posts something, and the user then, uh, let's say the user posts something, uh, and the uh, the user then, uh, you know, to post something infringing. Um, basically, the <coughs> copyright owner uh, is, you know, the onus is on the copyright owner to come in and do a takedown, right? So they would come in, they would say, okay, hey, uh, here's a takedown request. They would serve that to the provider. Let's say I upload uh, offending content to YouTube, right? Uh, it would be on YouTube, or sorry, be on the uh, uh, copyright owner uh, to come in, identify the uh, the video on YouTube, and then serve a request to YouTube to get it taken down. Now, a lot of copyright owners don't like this because it puts the onus on them to go find infringing content. If you look at uh, a lot of your media uh, media sharing sites, and in fact, Mega Upload uh, was a great uh, was a great example of, of where this abuse ran rampant. Um, you know, frequently uh, folks would re-upload the same content again and again and again, uh, and Mega Upload largely turned a blind eye to this. Now, now that's a huge case that uh, has lots of other implications uh, that I don't have time to talk about now. Although we may do a future post on on some of the the less or known implications of that case. Um, but, uh, you know, again, with Mega Upload, what we saw traditionally was, or what we saw with that and other sites like that, is that they would remove the specific infringing content 
And they clearly had the ability to locate other copies by MD5 some, no less, right, um, of this infringing content. But, but they had no desire to do so because it was counter to their business model. Right? And there are a lot of other sites that are profiting, uh, lots of other sites and content aggregation uh, platforms uh, on the web that today profit on the backs of uh, copyright owners. And today it's very onerous for these copyright owners to go out, identify this content uh, on sites, again, that they do not own, um, and then issue these takedown requests. And so Article 13 turns that on its head. And it says that basically they're going to create or, or basically uh, uh, forces the creation of a uh, or, or asks each media company to create a copyright database or a copyright, uh, uh, copyrighted material database. And so copyright holders can then submit to these databases proactively. And if matching content, infringing content is uploaded to the site, it's automatically not allowed to be broadcast or, or to be played or, or ultimately to be loaded and distributed on those platforms, right? And so again, picture DMCA, the onus 100% is on the copyright owner. Um, on the, with Article 13, the onus is 100% on the, uh, excuse me, on the, uh, the actual platforms to proactively filter this content. Now, there's a lot of questions about this, right? For, for one, feasibility is probably the big one. Um, we got to kind of step back here and, and say, you know, to what standard are we going to identify uh, that these works are actually owned by the copyright holders themselves? Um, what's to stop somebody from, and again, how specific are the copyrights going to be? What's to stop somebody from asserting copyright uh, when, you know, copyright of, of, let's say, Creative Commons material, right? Uh, submitting it to the database uh, and then Creative Commons material can no longer be distributed. There's, there's lots of problems here, realistically, too, uh, from a feasibility standpoint. Uh, most platforms simply are not going to create their own, uh, create their own filters. Uh, this is going to force them to move to some kind of centralized filtering service. I can see business lines sprouting up around this, by the way. Um, and so as these business lines stand up and as, as you have these filtering, uh, filtering clearing houses, I guess, or copyright uh, clearing houses, again, one of the things that we expect to see is probably, I expect at least, um, is uh, rampant over-enforcement of uh, and, and laying claims to, uh, to copyrights. And, and again, I'm kind of picturing this like the patent troll problem that we've been having in the U.S. recently. Uh, again, you know, what I, what I picture is people basically staking claims and saying, no, no, that's my, uh, you know, basically this is my content, uh, this matches, and again, the match technology that will be used is completely unknown as well. Are we talking about MD5 some? Are we talking about image recognition? Uh, how significantly close uh, to the photo must, uh, you know, must that be to be infringing? Uh, there's, you know, if it's a photo, for instance, a video, uh, are, are parody works allowed? And how will parody works be treated for that matter, right? Um, again, you know, there's, particularly when we're talking about automated matching, uh, how would a parody work be, be, uh, be treated there or fair use? And so there's a lot that plays in here, right? Um, look, from an InfoSec perspective, we should absolutely care about this because this is going to create a lot of compliance issues, uh, both Article 11 and Article 13. Both are going to create a lot of compliance issues. I'm particularly concerned about Article 13 from an InfoSec standpoint, and I want to take off my privacy hat for a minute and talk about the realistic impl implications here uh, for InfoSec. Whenever we do phishing campaigns, one of the things that we try to do is put people into a state of confusion. When people are in a state of confusion, they psychologically desire to get out of the state of confusion. And they'll do a lot of things to get out of that state of confusion that they no, won't normally do. Right? We know not to go click links, but I'll tell you one of the things that, uh, particularly on unsolicited emails or open attachments, but I'll tell you one that works uh, consistently well for us is notifying somebody that they've been caught by a speed camera, right? And uh, ultimately that they uh, they're being assessed a three hundred and fifty dollar fine, um, and that uh, you know again if they want to combat that or if they want to fight this, uh, click here to download the PDF that opens up the photo of your car on the speed camera. Uh, also here if you want to dispute the charge. Just go ahead. Uh, just go ahead and click this link uh, and fill in your information, and uh, you know we'll certainly uh, send that to an adjudicator, right? And of course, we're very careful about the way we craft these emails uh, so that we're not claiming to represent any particular government. In fact, that actually helps us because one of the first things people question is, how the heck did they get me? I don't even have speed cameras in my area. In fact, we find that this is actually. Uh, very, very effective speed in red light cameras uh, in areas where there are no speed or red light cameras used. Now, again, this is a state of confusion that people are entering, right? And again, uh, as they look at this, they're like, what, a fine? 
there's no way I couldn't be me, whatever. And, and they'll click a link. They'll absolutely submit information. It's absolutely wild the stuff that they'll do uh, to, uh, you know, basically to uh, to get out of that state of confusion. And so, you know, as I look at this and I picture uh, Article 13, I picture a lot of spear phishing emails. And look, I'm more than happy to capitalize on this as an infosec practitioner as this plays out as an incident responder. Um, I expect to work lots of uh, business email compromise as well as uh, overall system compromise that begin with one of these uh, one of these emails. Uh, basically, it's going to go something along the lines of infringing content has been discovered. Uh, click here, or you're you know within the next uh, 24 hours to you know basically file a rebuttal, or your account's going to be suspended. Right? Uh, you know, for a lot of people, Facebook is a lifeline to uh, to loved ones and and old friends. And, and again, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or or heck, even your Gmail service for that matter. Again, you know, attackers are going to capitalize on this, and uh, you know they're going to put people in states of confusion. I do see a realistic infosec issue here again separately there's going to be a huge compliance issue uh, again how are these databases uh, maintained what do the interfaces look like uh, to make those queries uh, you know as a final point i'm going to mention that both article 11 and article 13 more Article 13 than anything else, um, certainly hurts small content providers, right? Um, so, you know, let's say, for instance, uh, I know, for instance, the jester uh, has his own Mastodon instance uh, where he uh, basically uh, brings people in uh, to that Mastodon instance, and that's their own social network, as it were. Uh, I don't participate in that. That's a lot of, uh, you know, again, in general, we have these private private-ish social networks, right? So invite-only uh, kind of things. That tends to be a, uh, a little bit more group uh than, uh, you know, currently suits my, uh, suits my taste. But that said, on these smaller instances, right? Um, let's suppose for a moment that uh, that somebody does publish a copyrighted uh, does publish a copyrighted work, right? Um, if the jester hasn't, uh, you know, again isn't uh, directly monitoring that, uh, uh, you know, monitoring that and doesn't have uh, basically the upload filter in place, they're actually liable under Article 13 for damages. Uh, again, those haven't yet been established or set what those damages are going to be. Um, but look at GDPR, and again, you know, lest somebody think I'm overreacting, uh, again, you know, GDPR was one of those things that I think a lot of people looked at and they're like, eh, it'll work itself out by the time it's implemented. And uh, I, I don't really think that's the case. I think if you look around, there are a lot of folks that are completely non, uh, non-compliant with GDPR. Uh, the very hotel that I'm staying in right now, where I'm shooting this video from, uh, I can tell you categorically is not compliant with GDPR uh, based on the amount of information that they tried to get from me as I, as I uh, came to the hotel and checked in and I asked specifically, what are you doing with this? How are you protecting this information or GDPR? Which one of the six, uh, you know, basically uh, six, and I don't expect the front desk clerk, six reasons, by the way, for collecting data is this. I don't expect the front desk clerk to know but I do expect the manager to know, and I, I went ahead and asked because why not? I'm here, it's a good sample, uh, and uh, I can't get that sample back in the US. Um, and then followed up with uh, the manager doesn't know, and I said, listen, even if you don't know, can you point me to where uh, this is? Uh, turns out, uh, even a day later, check back in. Uh, turns out the manager said, yep, I, I, I've asked, I asked my manager, the GM, and, and I still don't know, uh, we, we don't know where to send you. So this is a hotel who's asking for information, and again, whether or not the overall the overall chain is GDPR compliant. I would say the very fact that they can't answer these questions makes it very unlikely that they are. And that's in the European Union. Shift out of the EU, holy goodness, right? Uh, I would say it's a bloodbath there. Um, look, Article 11 and Article 13, if these are voted in as written, um, this, this is going to be a problem for us long term. And I want to point out, too, that even, even if tomorrow the vote goes our way, and Article 11 and Article 13 are sent back uh, back to the drawing board or back for revisions. Um, make no mistake about it. This is something that's coming like a freight train. Um, you know, this is something that is an idea that I think is highly unlikely to die. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we have to be vigilant uh, in, you know, vigilant in uh, kind of our outlook uh, and, and definitely keep this, uh, you know, keep this in mind. How is this going to impact the way that we do our work, the way that we communicate with our world, and also the security implications of this? Again, the, the phishing implications are, are absolutely huge. The compliance implications are, are probably larger. Um, and so uh, really interested to see how this plays out. But look, uh, hey, I, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and close this out here and just say, uh, obviously, you know how I, how I hope the vote goes to tomorrow. Uh, one way or the other, though, we're going to stay vigilant, uh, certainly, uh, and, uh, you know, stay vigilant along these lines, stay educated. Uh, that, that's the only way to stay ahead in InfoSec. In any case, uh, Jake Williams for Edition InfoSec, signing off.